spiritual life as a disciple of Jesus Christ is to be in relationship with other believers who hold you accountable to the standards of God's Word in your walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. Years ago, John Wesley had a very successful evangelistic ministry preaching in open fields in England. They kicked him out of every church. They wouldn't let him preach in churches any longer, but he preached in the open fields and he saw multitudes of people come and place their faith in Jesus Christ. But he noticed something that happened as he went from one town to the next town. The people that he had awakened in the previous town quickly fell asleep. And he realized that the fruit of his evangelism wasn't producing anything. And so he recognized that there was a need for small groups, so he began to form what he called classes, 12 Christians meeting together weekly to hold one another accountable, to encourage one another in their faith in Christ, to be mutually accountable before the Lord. They would ask one another questions like this. Have you given time for the Bible to speak to you every day this past week? Are you enjoying your prayer time with the Lord? When did you last speak to someone about your faith in Jesus Christ? Did you pray about the money you spent this past week? Did you insist on doing something about which your conscience told you was wrong or uneasy? These are good questions for all of us as believers to consider, good questions to help us hold accountability with one another because accountability is valuable for us. In fact, when we look into God's Word, we see that He commands us in terms of our relationships with one another in the body of Christ to be mutually accountable, to help one another grow in our faith in Christ. In fact, the issue of accountability extends far beyond just us personally and individually and in families and churches. It expand, expands in God's Word to the area of civil government. You know, one of the oxymorons of our day is that institution down in the District of Columbia that is known as the Government Accountability Office. Perhaps you've heard of it. They say that their mission is this, and I'm quoting them. It is to support the Congress in meeting its constitutional responsibilities. Oh, really? Okay. And to help improve the performance and ensure the accountability of the federal government for the benefit of the American people. Well, if it wasn't so tragic, it would actually be humorous that such a statement has been made. Because we all know, the American people know, that our government is not accountable to we the people. In fact, it refuses to be accountable to we the people, which is why they don't have a budget. Every family has a budget. They don't have a budget. Haven't had a budget for what? Eight years or something now? They're not accountable. And furthermore, we know that they're not acting in ways that are benefiting us as the American people. The people who hired them, it seems that they're in existence for their own selfish ends, not for what they are supposed to be about. And the ballot box seems, at least in my opinion, to prove a very poor means of accountability that we the people have. What's gone wrong in that picture? Well, the Word of God tells us very clearly. Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says, for all, how many? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every human being is a sinner, and even if they are redeemed, even if they are regenerated, even if they are sanctified, therefore it is extremely unwise to place power, unlimited, unchecked power in the hands of any human being. You can only place power in the hands of another human being if it's very safe, safely and securely circumscribed and sharply limited. Knowing that all human beings are fallen, the question is, why should we trust anyone with power at all? And can we do so in a way in which they can be held accountable? If you have your Bible, turn to Exodus 18 this morning, because the Bible does give us a formula by which civil government can be held accountable for its actions and actually held accountable by the people, ultimately, as well as checks and balances within the design of civil government itself. Turn to Exodus chapter 18, because here, godly advice given to Moses by Jethro gives us the structure that actually our founders in this country followed as they built our civil government. Look at Exodus chapter 18, beginning at verse 13. Here's the answer of handling power, the problem of power. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses sat to judge the people. 
And the people stood by Moses from the morning unto the evening. And when Moses, his father-in-law, saw all that he did to the people, he said, What is this thing that thou doest to the people? Why sittest thou thyself alone, and all the people stand by thee from morning unto evening? And Moses said unto his father-in-law, Because the people come unto me to inquire of God. When they have a matter, they come unto me, and I judge between one and the other, and do make them know the statutes of God and his laws. And Moses' father-in-law said unto him, The thing that thou doest is not good. Thou wilt surely wear away both thou and this people that is with thee, for this thing is too heavy for thee. Thou art not able to perform it thyself alone. Hearken now unto my voice. I will give thee counsel, and God shall be with thee. Be thou for the people to Godward, that thou mayest bring the causes unto God. Let's pause right there. Because we notice here that Jethro sees what Moses does on his average work day from sunup to sundown, judging the people, a long line outside of the tent of Moses there. He sees that and he criticizes Moses. He says, Moses, the thing you're doing is not good. Now notice what he criticizes Moses for, not for the fact that in judging he brings the people's disputes before Almighty God. No, no, no. He doesn't criticize him for that, which by the way, is the criticism leveled against anyone today who believes that God's law is the supreme law of the universe and therefore is the standard by which all human-made law must be measured, all man-made legislation must be measured, and that's simply to have a biblical view of law and government. Jethro had a biblical view of law and government. He had no disagreement with, my, with, with uh, Moses about bringing the disputes before the law of God and the law of God being supreme. Rather, Jethro was criticizing Moses because he saw Moses attempting the impossible. Moses being the only one to judge among these two millions of peoples. And therefore, he saw that long line outside Moses' tent. He knew what was happening is that justice for many of those people, justice was being delayed. And the proof was there day in, day out, week in, and week out. You've probably heard the legal maxim that justice delayed is justice denied. And that principle comes right back here to Exodus 18 where Jethro is saying it is not good for justice to be delayed because it delayed is denied. In fact, in our own tradition, going back through English common law all the way to Magna Carta, this idea of justice delayed, justice denied from Exodus 18 has been preserved. I'm quoting from the Magna Carta in Clause 40 which reads, to no one will we sell, to no one will we refuse or delay right or justice. Those barons there at Runnymede were citing Exodus 18 as the source, God's authority for doing so. And you know, it's not just that in ancient history that they understood this, but even as, as recent as 1970, the Chief Justice of our U.S. Supreme Court, Warren Burger, noted in an address he made in 1970, and I quote him, a sense of confidence in the courts is essential to maintain the fabric of ordered liberty for a free people, and three things could destroy that confidence and do incalculable damage to society. Notice what he says the three things are. First, that people come to believe that the inefficiency and delay will drain even a just judgment of its value. Justice delayed, justice denied. Secondly, he said that people who have long been exploited in the smaller transactions of daily life come to believe that courts cannot vindicate their legal rights from fraud and overreaching. And then third, that people come to believe the law in the larger sense cannot fulfill its primary function to protect them and their families in their homes, at their work, and on the public streets. I ask, have those three things since 1970 become a fact of reality in our land? I would say indeed they have. One of which, of course, is justice denied as the court backlog means that many people who want to take a case to court takes them a long, long time before they actually uh, get to court. 
Justice delayed, justice denied. The fabric of a just ordered liberty has been destroyed if we just measure it on those standards. So the fact that Moses was bearing here in Exodus 18, Moses was bearing the burden alone meant that justice was being delayed and denied for a large number of people in Israel. And that Moses, in addition, was being worn out by all of that work. Now put yourself for a moment in Moses' shoes. Can we understand why he made a decision to say, I'm the only one really here that can do this judging? After all, he was aware of human sinful nature, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And he would ask the question that we would ask, why trust that power in the hands of anyone? Moses could look around among the two million that were following and realize that none of them, None of them had the formal education which he had enjoyed. You remember, he was raised in Pharaoh's court, which means he was exposed to all the educational advantages and opportunities of the world's superpower of that day. He went to the finest universities and the finest education in every subject area, including law, that Egypt had to offer. He was being groomed and trained to be part of that court life in Egypt. And beyond any argument, he was the best educated man among the children of Israel in that day. Furthermore, in addition to that education, he was a man who had a close relationship with God. He knew God's law. He knew God's statutes. He had had a face-to-face -face encounter with God. Who else, therefore, would be qualified to this task of judging? We're going to see in Jethro's counsel. What Jethro counsels him to do is to train up a group of people who will be qualified to judge, who will know the statutes and the law of God, that it would not be Moses alone, that Moses, in a sense, would make disciples, training people in God's word, God's law, so that they could be judges even as he was. But we know that even if a person is redeemed, come to faith in Christ, even if they are regenerated, their heart has been changed, even if they are sanctified and they're moving forward spiritually, none of them is perfect. None of them will be completely godly. None of them will certainly above, be above the temptations to power. Sometimes we don't know what a person will do until they have power. They may make promises, they may make assurances, and then all of a sudden the temptations of power come upon them and they are a changed person. I appreciate what Henry Nouwen observed. What makes the temptation of power so seemingly irresistible? Maybe it is that power offers an easy substitute for the hard task of love. It seems easier to be God than to love God. Easier to control people than to love people. I think he's correct in that. There's vast temptations that are associated with power. And although Jethro doesn't state this in his criticism, it is true that a monopoly on power is always a dangerous thing. Surely we could trust Moses. Yes, Moses was a good and godly man, but what happens when Moses dies? If that structure of one judge for the whole nation of two million is left and Moses dies, who replaces him? How do we know that we can trust that person? A monopoly on power is always a dangerous thing. A situation where justice is administered by one person alone is not likely to produce justice for a very long time. Instead, it's going to produce the other. Well, let's look at the solution that Jethro offers, beginning in verse 20. Exodus 18, beginning in verse 20. Jethro says, And thou shalt teach them, that is the whole people, the entire children of Israel, all two million of them, thou shalt teach them the ordinances and the laws, and thou shalt show them the way wherein they must walk and the work that they must do. Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens, and let them judge the people at all seasons. And it shall be that every great matter they shall bring unto thee, but every small matter they shall judge so it shall be easier for thyself, and they shall bear the burden with thee. If thou shalt do this thing, and God command thee so. He's saying, if this is God's command, then follow it. And we see that Moses does. And God's command thee, then thou shalt be able to endure. And all this people shall go to their place in peace. That is, their conflicts will be resolved. 
So Moses hearkened to the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he had said. And Moses chose able men out of all Israel and made them heads over the people, rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. And they judged the people at all seasons, the hard cases they brought unto Moses, but every small matter they judged themselves. And Moses and his father-in-law, Moses let his father-in-law depart, and he went his way into his own land. So this advice that was given by Jethro was not just good advice, not just godly advice, but it was actually godly instruction. We see that Moses recognized that this was God's direction and instruction for him to structure this uh, judicial branch of civil government on four levels. Look back at verse 19, where it says, Jethro says, I will give thee counsel, and God will be with thee. Be thou for the people to God word. And then look at verse 23 where it says, and God command thee so. So we see the passages saying this was God's instruction through Jethro for Moses and for structuring the judicial branch of the government of the children of Israel. This structure is God's plans for them. In fact, I would argue this structure is God's design for human civil government worldwide. That if a wise government said, we want to follow God's design for human civil government, this four-level structure is what they also would follow. Notice that it's a horizontal division of power, four levels of government. And before we look at those four levels specifically, note that the Word of God also speaks of a vertical separation of power. If you're seeing a chart, there's four levels, and those four levels are further divided top to bottom with four different functions. And those functions are given to us in Isaiah 33 and verse 22. For the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king. He will save us. So for each of those four levels, there's a judicial branch. The Lord is our judge. There's judges on all four levels. The legislative branch, the Lord is our lawgiver on four levels of lawgiving. And the Lord is our king, that is the executive branch on four levels. So you have 12 boxes, and I would argue scripture also says there is a check on all 12 of those boxes of we the people serving as a juror that can judge the work of the legislative, executive, and judicial branch as to whether it is correct in accordance with God's word and God's law, or if it is not correct. So this structure that was set up, Moses was instructed here to train up, first of all, all the citizens in the law of God. They were all to know God's law and God's ordinances. Furthermore, they must know how they are to walk, that is how they are to live their lives in obedience to God's law, and they must know, the judges that is, must know the work that they are assigned to do. Now notice, we're going to see the qualifications in a moment, but what they did privately was very important for their public service. It was not a situation that character didn't matter and whatever you do in private doesn't matter as we were lied to during the Clinton era that, oh, what he does in private doesn't matter. It's only oh, what he's doing publicly. No, their private lives, what they did in obedience to God's word and God's law was part of their job because if they did not demonstrate godliness in their private lives, they were not to be even selected or retained as judges in this public work. Let's look at this, these structures that were built, the four levels. We'll start at the very bottom, the tens. And what it means here, and the reference of the Hebrew word refers to ten families. So wherever there are ten families, those ten families will have one judge over them. That is, if there's a property dispute between family A and family B of the ten families, that property dispute between those two families is to be brought before the judge who is going to render, according to God's law, the just judgment between those two families which are in conflict with one another. Of course, this judge, therefore, would have to be well-versed in God's law to know how God's law applies to this particular property dispute between those two families. And just above the tens is the 50. For every 50 families, there was to be a judge that if at the level of the tens, that judge made a decision that one of the parties felt was unjust, felt was not in accordance with God's word, God's law, they could appeal up to the next level of the judge, the judge of the 50s. 
and this appeal process. Obviously, Moses couldn't handle all of these appeal decisions. If an appeal is being made from the tens to the fifties, that's not Moses to handle it because if he handled all the appeals, he would be just as busy and just as overwhelmed as if nothing had been structured at all. So the appeal process, it would appear, is a decision on the part of the judge at the level of the 50s as to whether the decision of the judge at the 10s was biblical, was accordance with God's law, was uh, uh, sound. If it was a sound decision, then he would not hear the case. If an error had been made, then he would hear the case. And of course, if at the 50s he made an error, then that could be appealed up to the level of the 100s. And if the 100s made an error, then it could be healed all the way to the thousands. And if the thousands made an error, it could be appealed ultimately to Moses, in a sense, as the head of that judicial uh, system. Notice, first of all, what we see here is that government at the lowest level is the closest to you and the most important to preserve justice. Every 10 families would have a judge. Every 50 families, there would be a judge at that level, every 100 families and so on. And that meant that there was a whole lot of people judging in, in, the, in these positions. That the structure was that there was government at a very local level. I live in a neighborhood, I'm, I'm told there's about 8,000 people. 8,000 people, wow, that would mean that the, at the tens, there's 800, you know, there'd be a whole level of people in there that would, uh, that would mean government is very close to the people and, and that uh, provides a means of accountability we'll talk about in a moment. Contrast that with the founders of our country because in, in our constitution, they did speak about a size of government at the federal level. They talk about in, in Article 1 that uh, it says that representatives, one representative uh, shall not exceed for every one 30,000 people, one representative for 30,000 people. That means your congressman down in Washington, D.C. is only supposed to be representing, and it hasn't been amended, by the way, 30,000 people. Today, that number is about 700 to 800,000 people. We're over that limit by 23 times which tells us we have a government that is not close to the people, not even close to what the scripture describes, but not even close to what our founders described. And you ask what happened, well, beginning of the 20th century, they saw what the Constitution said, and they just threw it in the trash can. They said, we're not gonna follow that anymore. If we were to follow that, they say that would be impossible. There'd be 10,000 uh, representatives down in, in, in the House of Representatives, 10,000, they couldn't accomplish anything. Great, yeah, that'd be good for all of us, right? Or the other solution, I think envisioned by our founders, it means you have to have more than one country. Instead of being the United States of America, there ought to be 23 countries if we were to preserve that ratio they spoke of there. Because a small government is far better at preserving your God-given liberties, your God-given rights, than a gargantuan, monstrous government such as we have today. That's the first thing I see in this pattern. Imagine that. Every 10 families, there was a level of government, at least on the judicial level, but maybe also legislative level and executive level. Every 10 families, there was a level of government that they could relate to. They had a conflict. They could bring that conflict to that judge and see it resolved. It's interesting that uh, in English common law, this pattern here of the tens, the fifties, the hundreds, and so forth was followed and applied. And uh, by the way, you know, some of this still remains in our culture. I don't know if you've ever been over on the eastern shore. There's an area called the Old, old 100. Have you ever seen that? When I saw it at first, what's that about, the Old 100? Who's, is that 100? What? And reading this and studying this, I realized, oh, that's the Bible here. 100 families lived in this district, and that was a unit of society. In fact, our founders followed this four-level structure. Local government, at the most local level, maybe it's your town or maybe it's your community. Then county government at the next level, and then state government at the next level, and the federal government. Four levels of government designed uh, from here, from Exodus chapter 18. Now let's look quickly at the qualifications because this is extremely important. Perhaps the most important factor here is choosing and qualifying those who are going to function as the judges. And this structure would only work. Justice would only be served when men selected for this work met all four of these qualifications. And note here that these qualifications are primarily moral qualifications. Oh, they don't have to have a law degree. 
No, they don't have to attend law school. They don't have to pass the bar. They don't have to serve as a... No, all those things that today people require of somebody to be a judge, they were not required at all. No. In fact, what's evident here is that amateurs were being trained by Moses to make these judgments. That's right, amateurs who were immersed in the law of God and who met these four qualifications, these were the ones that were making the judgments. These were the ones that were serving as judges. Rank amateurs. Oh, how horrifying. Well, you know what? The beginning of our country. That's exactly what happened in courtrooms. It was the amateurs, not the professionals, that made the most important decisions in the court. How do we know that? That was the function of the jury. The jury was to judge the evidence. The jury was to judge the witnesses. The jury was to judge the arguments brought into court. The jury was to judge the law as well to determine if the law was in compliance with the laws of the universe, the laws of nature and nature's God. And if it was not, Case tossed out, the guy is innocent because the law itself was guilty. That still is preserved even in our Maryland Constitution, Article 23, but has been rejected by and large. It's the professionals today, we're told, that have to do the judging. God's Word says, no, no, no. Amateurs trained and immersed in God's Word with these four qualifications, they can be the best judges. Notice the first qualification there. It says that they are able, able. They would need to be skilled and knowledgeable in what? In God's law. Able to apply God's law to everyday conflicts that were brought before them in the courtroom. Contrast the school, because Moses obviously had to train these, these judges to be. The school that Moses developed to train them in God's law and God's word. Contrast that with how judges are prepared in America today. Moses took them to God's word, the standard intensively studying God's Word, practicing taking the principles of God's law and applying those principles in everyday life, situations that they would likely encounter. Today, how are lawyers trained? They spent, Natalie could probably tell me how many hundred thousand hours or more in law school. And what are they studying in law school? They're studying primarily the decisions of other judges and what those judges said about some what other judges said. And the decisions they have rendered, I'm told that they never actually study the supreme law of these United States. They never actually read the U.S. Constitution or understand the meaning of those words put to paper by our founders. That's not what law school is about. What they teach them is to memorize a man-made standard. They never study God's law in law school today. In fact, they are thoroughly indoctrinated, if, I, if what I'm hearing is correct, thoroughly indoctrinated in this lie that God's law has no place at all in judgments made in courts in America today, in the history of America, in our legal system. And I dare say that's why our legal system is such a shambles and injustice is not done. Not only would the founders of our country be shocked by this condition in our country today, they would be outraged by this. They didn't die on the battlefields. They didn't sacrifice their fortunes and their families and everything in their life. They didn't do that to establish a country that would say God's law is trash and we're not going to obey God's law at all. No, they bled and died in order that God's law would be the standard, would be the foundation. You say, David, how do you know that? You know it from the organic law of these United States, the Declaration of Independence, which is the law. Legally, it is the law. And it states the foundation of all law is the laws of nature and nature's God by which they're referring to the Bible. I can prove that to you. I don't have time to do that this morning. You can uh, research many aspects of what William Blackstone said. God's law is the final standard. It is what the laws of nature and nature's God refers to. Quite in contrast today, we don't train judges that way at all. And so God's word by his standard tells us that no lawyers trained in this current system in our land are qualified to be judges. That's what it says. They're disqualified from being judges. At least, that is, unless they repent. Unless they are retrained through an immersion in God's word and God's law and a conversion of their hearts and minds to believe that God's law is the supreme law of the universe that governs everything, including what takes place in the courtroom. And unless they also have a rod of steel 
shoved up their spinal column that will enable them to stand against all the unlaw that passes in our courtrooms for so-called justice today. Those are the only ways someone who's been trained as a lawyer will be fit to serve as a judge by God's word. First thing, a man must be able. Second qualification, notice what the second qualification is. He must be God-fearing. Proverbs chapter 1 verse 7 tells us the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 10 tells us the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. To have knowledge and to have wisdom, you must first have the fear of the Lord. A person without a fear of God should never be trusted with any position of power or authority over others at all. Consider one example. What if a policeman has no fear of God? What if he shoots an innocent, unarmed young man who is no threat to that policeman or to anyone else at all? And what if he shoots that young man knowing that young man is also unarmed and knowing that young man is not a threat to anyone? What has the policeman done? He has demonstrated that he has no fear of God, has he not? For if he feared God, he would know he could not get away with murder. Oh yeah, he might get away with it. They might cover him up here and, and promote him and, and give him all sorts of rewards in this life. But if he fears God, he knows one day he's going to stand before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ and he's going to be tried for murder and that there's going to be all hell to pay for the crime that he has committed. Anyone who does not fear God should not be trusted with any position of power over anyone at all. If they don't fear God, how can you be assured that at some point in time they will not abuse their power, they will not violate the God-given rights of others and become injurious rather than a blessing to the community, being a curse to the community? We must have God-fearing men. If they don't meet that qualification, they're not to be admitted. Thirdly, notice this qualification, honest. They must love the truth. Here's an obvious qualification for someone who is a judge, because if a judge is not honest, what he will do and what he will say from the bench will destroy rather than establish justice. You know, if he's not honest, there's no way you should trust him. Years ago, there was a professional golfer, Roy Floyd, who was getting ready to tap a routine nine-inch putt. That's pretty easy, standard stuff. But he saw his ball move ever so slightly before he came up to it. And according to the rule book, if the ball moves in this way, the golfer must take a penalty stroke. Here's the decision point, honesty. Considering the situation, Floyd was among the leaders in that tournament, offering a prize of over $100,000. To acknowledge that the ball had moved could mean he'd lose his chance for some big money. Walter, uh, writer David Holohan describes as follows what might he might have done. Oh, the athlete ducks his head and flails wildly with his hands as if he's being attacked by a killer bee. And next he backs from the ball and rubbing his eye for some phantom speck of dust, all the while scanning his playing partners as well as the gallery for any sign that the ball's movement has been detected by others. And if the coast is clear, he simply taps the ball in for his par. Ray Floyd, however, did not do that. He assessed himself that penalty and wound up with a bogey on that hole. You see, honesty is most important because it always comes with a personal, expensive price tag attached to us. Think of uh, Lauren Morris, who was writing in the Reader's Digest about a friend of his, said, my friend David, coming from the big city, wasn't prepared for the approach that rural Maine businessmen had towards their customers. Shortly after David moved there, he rented a rototiller from the local hardware store. The store owner showed him how the rototiller worked and, and functioned and explained the charge for the rototiller was not based on how long he kept it out of the store. Rather, it was based on how long he actually used the rototiller. Well, David took a look at this rototiller for some kind of meter that would measure the time used on the rototiller and puzzled, he asked the store owner, well, how will you know how long I've used it? With a quizzical look, the owner simply replied, you will tell me. You will tell me. It was astonishing from the big city. He'd never expect anyone would trust their customers to be honest. You see, honesty is absolutely critical. Without honesty, 
there can certainly be no justice. Indeed, without honest judges, justice will fall. Think for a moment, just regarding the top judges in America today. Are they honest men and women? Did not each of them take an oath to uphold the United States Constitution before they were seated as judges? Was their oath an honest one? Wow. You can see right to the root of injustice in our land in answering that question. The further question is this. Why do the American people tolerate such blatant dishonesty? These men needed to be able. They needed to be God-fearing. They needed to be honest. And fourthly, they needed to be haters of covetousness. Not just, oh, I'm neutral about covetousness. I'm not for it or against it. Just neutral. No, haters of covetousness. This would mean that they are unbribable men. If someone is in a position of power and they have a covetous heart, they will abuse their power for financial gain at one point in time or another. Webster's 1828 Dictionary describes bribery as this, the act or practice of giving or taking rewards for corrupt practices, the act of paying for or receiving a reward for a false judgment or testimony, or for the performance of that which is known to be illegal or unjust. It is applied both to he who gives and to he who receives the compensation, but appropriately to the giver, end quote. A covetous heart will take a bribe at some point in their career. And we need to recognize that that kind of a heart is dangerous to put in a position of power. And uh, indeed, a covetous heart will ultimately bring destruction. I was reading a, an article by Bob James who said, Recently, he went out and discovered he had an infestation of fire ants, poisonous stinging ants in his yard. He said, I laid a small circle of poison around those stinging ants in that ant hill. And, of course, those ants, thinking those granules were food, they began to pick them up and carry them back into their colony. I returned later to see how well the poison was working, and hundreds of stinging ants were carrying that poison down into their ant hill. But then I noticed a little break in the circle of that poison. Some of the poison was moving in the opposite direction away from their anthill. See, some smaller non-stinging ants had found this food and they were stealing their neighbor's food, thinking they were getting the other ant's treasure while they were unwittingly poisoning themselves. When we desire what someone else has more than we have, we must beware. The hunger to beg, borrow, or steal our way into what is theirs will poison us spiritually indeed. Now, this system that Jethro was presenting to Moses, Moses implemented as God's law, God's standard for his people. Moses acted and he added one crucial element, not recorded here at Exodus 18, but it's recorded in Deuteronomy chapter 1. If you just turn there for a moment. Deuteronomy chapter 1, which was 40 years later, Moses, reflecting back on what took place on that day, said this to the, the people of Israel. This is verse 9 and following, Deuteronomy 1 verse 9, and I spake unto you at that time, saying, I am not able to bear you myself alone. The Lord your God hath multiplied you, and behold, you are this day as of the stars of heaven for multitude. The Lord God of your fathers make you a thousand times so many more as ye are, and bless you as he hath promised you. How can I myself alone bear your cumbrance and your burden and your strife? Take you, and notice he's instructing the people of Israel, take you, wise men in understanding, and known among your tribes. In other words, people that you recognize meet these qualifications. Take you, wise men in understanding, and known among your tribes, and I will make them rulers over you. And he answered me and said, the thing which thou hast spoken is good for us to do. So I took the chief of your tribes, wise men and known, and made them heads over you, captains over thousands, captains over hundreds, captains over fifties, and captains over tens, and officers among your tribes. And I charged your judges at that time, saying, Hear the causes between your brethren, and judge righteously between every man and his brother and the stranger that is with him. Ye shall not respect persons in judgment, but ye shall hear the small as well as the great. Ye shall not be afraid of the face of man, for the judgment is God's, and the cause is too hard, and the cause that is too hard for you, bring it to me unto me, and I will hear it. And I commanded you at that time, and all the things which ye should do. Notice there in verse 13, 
Moses is instructing the children of Israel to make this selection among themselves, to look among themselves and see those that meet the fourfold qualifications as judges. Who is making those? The families. That is, the ten families would make a decision about electing one who is going to be their judge. Fifty families, one. Hundred families, one. Thousand families, one. So that the families, and this would mean the head of each family, was making that selection, casting their vote for those who would fulfill these jobs as judges. Interesting. The head of each family, representing the family, would give a vote for that family on all four levels of government, the tens, the fifties, the hundreds, the thousands. They were choosing those who were going to be their servants, those who were going to represent them. It's important to see the flow of accountability taking place here. The civil government is beholden to and the civil government is accountable to the family government. Family government chooses those to represent them in civil government and serve them in civil government. And family government can re remove those who fail to do their duty. Today, my friends, we have the absolute reversal of that God-given pattern. Today, we have civil government falsely making family government accountable to it. And there's a multitude of examples. Just think of truancy laws, for example, as one. The government says, you, the family, are accountable to the government for the education of the children God has entrusted to you. And if you don't do it properly, they will give you grief. How about child discipline? Here's an even worse example where the civil government says you better follow their rules about disciplining your children or child protective services claims that if you don't follow their rules, that it's their business to come and kidnap your children, to take them from you if you don't do what they demand. And in a multitude of ways, we find that civil government has turned the tables on us, that it is no longer accountable to we the people, to the family government, demanding rather that we be accountable to it. My friends, this is not government. This is tyranny. A just civil government preserves the God-given rights and it's best at the local level, the closest to the people, the tens. Because after all, that judge of tens, he would know all ten families. He'd be intimately acquainted with them and when a conflict comes up, he'd know details about their situation that the judge at the level of the thousands wouldn't have any idea about. He would know them. Because government at the closest level, most local, is the best. It's only the greatest matters that needed to move up the chain of appeals ultimately to Moses. Moses would only see those cases that related to fundamental matters, that related to decisions that would have an important repercussion throughout the entire two million children of Israel. And it would appear that Moses wasn't involved in making those decisions about which cases were appealed up that chain of appeal. Otherwise, he would have a great deal to deal with every single case, undoing the whole purpose for delegating authority down the chain. We long for justice to be established in our land, to have a civil government which is accountable to God's law, obeying God's law. But my friends, that can't happen on the civil government level until it happens in our self-government, in our family government, and in our church government when we make ourselves first accountable to God's law and God's commands. You see, God in his great wisdom has given us all that we need to be accountable. No one is to be given power without clear accountability. And each of these four levels of government were to be accountable to one another as well as ultimately accountable to the family government. And so we on a self-government and a family government level are instructed in God's word to be accountable to one another. Hebrews 10.24 says, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. And so let us lovingly hold one another accountable to obey God's law in our own lives as we seek to disciple this nation and bring it into obedience to God's law. Let's pray. Oh God, our Father, we thank you and praise you for the great wisdom of your word. We thank you how through the history of England and America, they sought to follow these instructions here in your word in Exodus 18. We see that we have lost it. We've lost it because rebels have taken over not just civil government, but church government and even family government. Father, we pray for repentance in our nation, a revival, a return to your word and to obedience to your holy law. And 
may it begin with us, we pray in Jesus' blessed name. Amen. If you would take